founder, managing director at White Mana Capital Partners. Uh, William, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Fraser. Thanks. So I want to jump right in with the questions here. Uh, I'd like to sort of level set by asking, uh, what do the medical affairs and medical science liaison professions look like today? And how do these roles fit into the broader biopharma and life sciences ecosystems? So the way I think about the medical affairs profession, it's two parts. It is really the arm of the pharmaceutical company that educates healthcare providers and generates data, clinical trial data, once the drug is approved. So after a drug is approved, who in the pharmaceutical company generates the new data for the drug? Medical affairs. So if the drug, let's say, has an indication for diabetes and you want to get a new indication, let's say, for obesity or non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis, medical affairs would do it. Medical science liaisons, think of them as the field part for medical affairs. So people are familiar with pharmaceutical sales reps and pharma industry. Medical science liaisons are similar to pharma reps in the sense that they're in the field, but the big difference is they have no sales targets and they're all advanced training from a clinical and scientific perspective. They have MDs, PhDs, they're pharmacists. So when they go out and educate doctors, they're educating them on very in-depth disease state, scientific and technical information from the clinical data. And today, really the main face for the pharma company is the MSL, the medical science liaison. Do you know, this is a crazy statistic, on average, a pharma rep spends about one minute with a doctor. Oh, wow. But an MSL spends almost 45 minutes on average. Yeah, that's impressive. And it seems like that would be, you know, a very crucial role as more and more companies are sort of turning to these pipeline and a product type drugs where, you know, they have these large multi indication products. Yep, absolutely. But nowadays, there's more specialty products. Mm -hmm. So it requires more advanced knowledge, more advanced clinical understanding. And today in the world of AI, it, it requires more digital fluency and more understanding of how to use digital tools. That's one of the biggest gaps we're seeing at the ACMA when we work with our pharmaceutical partners. A lot of the MSLs, a lot of the medical affairs professionals, they just don't know that area very well. Right. So yeah, like maybe let's get into that a little bit. Uh, I wanted to ask briefly about uh, a program you work on, the Board Certified Medical Affairs Specialist Program. Uh, and, you know, essentially sort of what standards these medical affairs and MSL professionals should be aiming for. And uh, I was curious to ask as well how the utilization of newer technologies like artificial intelligence uh, might support those goals. Yeah, that's a great question. So about 10 years ago, the ACMA developed the first ever board certification for MSLs for medical affairs professionals called what you mentioned, the BCMAS program. And now the BCMAS program has become really the standard board certification, credentialing, training program for MSLs, for medical affairs professionals. We have learners, this is crazy, in over 80 countries. Oh, wow. Yeah, in over 80 countries. We have people in Kazakhstan that get board certified in medical affairs to the ACMA. And what it does is it teaches you all of the core functional skills you need to be an effective MSL or medical affairs professional in today's competitive market. Because remember, it's not just about being effective, but it's also about being compliant. Exactly, yeah. Today, when a health authority goes to audit a pharma company, you know one of the first divisions they go to? You guessed it, medical yeah, affairs. Yeah. yeah, because they know that MSL's medical affairs are talking about a lot of information, at least in an unsolicited way, even off-label information. Right. In a lot of my discussions with Congress, I've had you know a briefing with the U.S. Congress Health Subcommittee, with the FDA, they focus on MSL's and medical affairs, believe it or not. They want to know that there are standards in place. That's why, and I was talking about this at this conference, making sure that every MSL and every medical affairs professional, everybody within your organization is board certified, is not a nice to have anymore. It is a must have to protect the integrity of the medical affairs profession. So anyone listening out there, if you're an MSL leader and you're a medical affairs leader, and you think doing basic onboarding and training is good enough, I'm here to tell you it is not. Today, the new currency of credibility is getting BCMAS. And in my, from my perspective, it doesn't just help you with the AI and the digital fluency, but it's really important for having compliance guardrails and ethics. Yeah. And I think that can't be bolted on. It needs to be embedded 
within the framework of a medical affairs governance. Right, yeah, that does seem like that would be the, the correct approach, especially as we're seeing lots of other policy shirts in healthcare in the U.S. and, you know, abroad as well. Absolutely. So, you know, I want to ask a little bit about the relationship uh, between these professions, medical affairs, MSL, and uh, payers, and sort of where those currently stand in the U.S. I'm curious, you know, what some of the barriers to engaging with payers are, and also, you know, some of their main concerns that maybe you're hearing when it comes to making coverage decisions. Oh, boy, you hit on a really really touchy area for I you. I figured this would be a spicy question. Yeah, especially in 2025. You know why? Think about how 2024 ended. Yeah. In 2024, one of the big stories in the news, very sad story, very sad story was what? The United Healthcare CEO was murdered. Right. Horrible story. Nothing justifies it. Mm. But why did this happen? If you go back, the person who murdered him, right? He had had an issue with prior authorization. He couldn't get some type of, I think, surgical procedure or therapy. But that sentiment is something that we've seen across America. Millions of patients can't get access to their medications. They can't get access to MRIs. They can't get access to surgical procedures. Why? The number one reason for care delay in America, Fraser, is prior authorization. According to the American Medical Association, 93% of care delays are related to prior authorization. Matter of fact, next week on my podcast, the Will Solomon podcast, we're going to have on the president of the American Medical Association. I know for the AMA, this is a hot, hot topic because it's costing the healthcare system billions of dollars. Now, the ACMA, we, and it's something I'm very proud of. We're the first organization in the United States, first ever organization, to develop a prior authorization certification program. Oh, it's, could you tell me a bit more about that? Yes. It's called the PATS program. It has really become now the standard. The top 100 pharma companies have implemented it. And what we do is we train and certify all the field reimbursement professionals in the pharma biotech space. We also train and certify all the prior off specials. So you know when you go to the doctor and you go to the doctor's office and you have the people there that are doing the billing and the coding and things like that? Yes. Yeah. We certify those people. Oh, we teach them how to reduce prior off denials. And we've actually been able to show we're the only educational program ever, first accredited one and only program ever, to show an almost 50% reduction in prior alt denials. Think about that, 50%. We've run models for a billion dollar drug. If you get a 10% reduction in the prior alt denials or a 10% improvement in market access for a billion dollar drug, you could save up to $100 million. And this is why all the top 100 pharma companies partner with the ACMA and it's something we're very proud of. And it's something that I think needs a lot of reform. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, it's getting worse. How so? How do you see that happening? Well, you talked about policy shifts. Right. Since the Trump administrations took over, one of the things that President Trump and administration have tried to do is look at this issue in the Most Favored Nations Act or policy. Right, yes. Right? Most Favored Nations is saying, look, why are we in America paying this amount, you know, high amount in, on, for our drugs, but in Canada and the UK and other countries, they're paying a lower amount. That's not fair. And so the Trump administration is trying to address that. What people don't know, if you read carefully in that policy, President Trump's administration wanted to address the middlemen, which are the PBMs. Right. Now for the folks listening out there, if you don't know what a PBM is, they are pharmacy benefit managers. They negotiate between the wholesalers and pharma manufacturers where your drug is going to form in the tier in the insurance formula, whether it's going to be in a preferred tier or a lower tier. Right. And there, those middlemen, unfortunately, contribute a lot to the higher cost of medications in America. And to his credit, President Trump had tried, tried to address this issue. But guess what? The lobbyists took it out. They took it out as so it goes. And so that's why I think the work that the ACMA is doing, whether it's on the MSL medical affairs side, trying to raise the bar, 
right? And this is why we've been called leaders in accreditation, certification, and training for the life sciences. This is why we've been called the gold standard. It's something I'm very proud of. And I'm also humbled by because we have tens of thousands of people and over these hundreds of companies where we've seen a real impact in effectiveness and compliance. So it's something that, you know, is really an honor to be a part of. Absolutely. And that, you know, that 50% rate trending toward, uh, you know, not prior off denials, uh, you know, that seems really crucial. And I appreciate bringing in the, the Brian Thompson murder, obviously an unjustified and terrible act, terrible. but it did illustrate very widespread frustration with, you know, the insurance framework in this country and, you know, how drugs are reimbursed and the problems that many, many people have. And I think that can't be ignored. Either. Absolutely. And now with AI, one of the things that we're doing is we have a reimbursement AI platform. We also have an ACM AI learning solution. And what we're doing now with pharmaceutical companies is saying, look, benchmark with certification, that's critical, but continue to customize, personalize your team's learning and give them a continuous roadmap for professional development. So we have this amazing learning solution. I believe it's revolutionized life sciences, education, learning, and development. It has these different components where you personalize the learning with our own proprietary AI platform. Then you reinforce it. Podcast learning. Right. You love to listen to podcasts? Of course, yes. So do I. Well, we have podcast learning. Yeah. We have micro-learning activities that you can deliver to your team members in their inbox, let's say once a month. Knowledge enhancements and checkers. Then we have simulation where let's say you're a doctor yeah. and I'm a medical liaison or a farmer up, our AI acts like a doctor. And it could simulate interactions with the MSL or with a sales rep. So you train and learn how to have effective interactions. You could practice those interactions and then you're ready to apply. And this learning solution is really is a continuum and it's based on the most advanced principles in pedagogy when it comes to adult-based learning. So it's something that really there's nothing like it in the industry. And again, if you're listening out there, it's something I'd really encourage you to look at to do, to implement for your MSL teams, your fill reimbursement teams, for your pharma sales teams. It's important when you're investing in training that you're doing something that reinforces it continually. Now we know this is how the brain works. Yeah, it seems really crucial to hit some of those newer, more innovative education approaches that kind of meet adults where they're at. Absolutely. Uh, that sounds fun. I, I love the simulation idea as well. Yeah. I write about that a lot in the manufacturing space, which is obviously more of a virtual reality type thing, but this sort of role playing with AI uh, yep. seems like such an you know, obvious but very effective way to you know, sort of prepare uh, you know, these professions for that. Uh, so, William, while I still have you here, I did just want to maybe close by asking if you could touch on any other ACMA uh, you know, success stories in recent years. I know you're probably pretty limited in when you can discuss about specific companies you work with, but you know, any high-level uh, milestones or highlights that, that you're proud of? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we do with the ACMA, as I mentioned, we, we partner with our pharmaceutical and biotech partners. We work with them to help certify, train their teams. And I would say one of the successes that we've seen, we've seen many, many successes, but really one of the biggest things that we've seen is when they come back to us and say, wow, you know, because we got trained by the ACMA, we were better able to help our healthcare provider offices to get their patients the medications they need. Oh, I love that. Or when we hear stories of, you know, when we implemented the BCMAS program, we saw that physicians saw us as more credible, as more competent, as more trustworthy. Matter of fact, we surveyed over 1,100 doctors. We asked them if Frazier had the BCMAS credential as an MSL, would that matter? You know what they said? Yes, I would assume. It, it matters a lot. It matters a lot. 87% Frazier said we would see them as more competent, Correct. more credible, more trustworthy. And here's the thing. The BCMAS program is for experienced MSL and medical affairs professionals. If you're listening out there, this is for experienced MSL medical affairs professionals. On average, the people that do the BCMAS program, they have five to seven years of experience. And we still, despite that, still we see an 80% improvement in knowledge. It makes them more prepared, more confident. 92% said it made them more prepared and confident. So again, I think the, the thing that I want to close with is this. As we go into 2026, we see all the evolutions in AI. We're in a new era. We're in a new world. 
So if you're doing training and a one and done, you're coming in for a day, you're bringing your team to do a training, you know, and you think you're good for the year, those days are gone. Those days are gone. Like today I saw that there's the launch of a new iPhone. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't. That new, that it's like a paper thin iPhone. It's a new era, right? In terms of the iPhone, the iPhone now actually, it's really interesting. You can actually have a conversation. If you have an iPhone and I have an iPhone in different languages and I can get it translated through my AirPods, in my preferred language. It's the, uh, the thing from the Hitchhiker's Guide. I can't it's a, it's yeah, it's crazy. So why I'm saying that is we're in a new era today. That new era means if you're leading an MSL and medical affairs team and you want to be in the cutting edge in the modern world, in the modern market, you've got to give your team BCMAS. It's the currency of today's market. It's not a nice to have, like I said, and you don't want to have variability. You want to have uniformity with your team. You want to level set your team. You want to give them better insights. You want to accelerate evidence generation. You want to be able to have them build better relationships with their KOLs. That's how you're going to stay competitive in the market. And the last thing I'll say is if I put my hedge fund hat on as a hedge fund manager, when we look at assets that we're going to invest in, one of the first things we look at, and this came up on my podcast, again, the Will Solomon podcast, I had on from Cantor Fitzgerald, Eric Schmidt, and Josh Schimmer, really the leaders in biotech sell-side equity. Oh, I read his notes a lot. Yeah, they're very famous in this space. You know what they said to me? What is that? We look at the pedigree. We look at the makeup of the management team, and we look at what the company is doing when it comes to establishing a global core standard playbook. And BCMS is that currency. Today, that's the currency. And that's why it's number one for a reason. So I hope that helps, and you know, I've enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. William, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to check out that podcast next week, and uh, hopefully some of our listeners can go get uh, certified. Absolutely. Frazier, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. You so much.